I did this for a long time. I was greedy. I wanted to make a lot of money on every trade. So I knew really that my stop should be here, but I would tighten the stop so that I could have a bigger size. I just kept getting stopped out. And you know, and because I was trading too big, each, each stop hurt. And in the end, I was just like, okay, you have got to trade smaller size with wider stops. And you know, you, you'll make less money on each trade, but you'll have more winning trades. Welcome back everyone, today we're sitting down with Jason Sen once again, this time in Bangkok. So how's it going Jason today? Good thanks mate, I'm following you around the world. Yeah, it's fun. We had a chat in a few months back in Phuket, which was really cool. I know people got a lot of value out of it, enjoyed it a lot. Today I want to talk about more like the, kind of go beyond what we discussed last time, talking about how you traded for institutions in the past, your experience with these kind of strategies, with trading uh, for, for big banks, or actually working with big banks and kind of to I know you give them your, your analysis in the past, you give them some, some tools on how to look at markets. So tell me about, first of all, what brings you to Bangkok this time? Uh, well, actually, my daughter's decided she wants to go to school up here, so I'm, I'm up here settling her into school. But I'll be coming backwards and forwards from Phuket to Bangkok. So cool. I think it's quite a good lifestyle, really. Bit yeah. of city and bit of beach life. Quite a nice balance. Bangkok is very really convenient. It's not the place for beach for sure, but it's a good place if you want to like, yeah, go around, be busy and stuff. So uh, tell me, like, since we published into you in the past few months, you told me you now are doing FTMO. For what reason and kind of how it's going so far? Actually, it's been something I wanted to do for a while, just as an experiment. Well, what I really wanted to do is get some of my subscribers to sign up. I was actually going to pay for them to sign up and, you know, give them my signals and, and see if I could get them through the challenge. Mm -hmm. It didn't quite work anyway. So um, I just thought, you know, what, I'm going to do this myself. Uh, I've never done it before. I, I didn't really study the rules. I just kind of signed up last week. But... Um, uh, as I've told you before, I don't have a lot of time to trade, if I'm honest. And I had my kids here, uh, over. my son from boarding school was over from June. And I just wanted to enjoy the summer with, with the kids. Now they've obviously gone back to school. So I thought, right, here we go. I'm going to sign up and give it a go. And then I can do like a, a video log of it all and throw it on my YouTube channel. See how I get on. I mean, I hope I, I, hope I pass it. It's going to be a bit embarrassing if I don't. Yeah, for sure. Now, what was the motivation? Is it just out of fun or is it just like you want to challenge yourself a little bit or what's the motivation behind taking FTMO? Okay, good question. There's actually kind of two motivations. I do want to challenge myself and I do want to get it done and I think it would be quite entertaining. Uh, I, I will enjoy the challenge. And also, you know, um, when you do what I do, when, I, you know, when I, I'm a signal provider, I'm an, I'm an analyst and I put out all this analysis and but people actually want to see people like you and I trade yeah. don't they yeah. because they're too you know there's so many people out there doing what we do but they're not really traders or they're only trading for a bit and you know they're trying to sell the services so I think it's important that every now and then you do actually sit down and do some real trades and some live trades and when you're doing it you know if I'm doing the FTMO challenge I can't cheat it I mean it is a demo account it's not real money yet but it would be fun to get finance and if I do then uh, then I'll continue to do it. Interesting, interesting. So I signed up for a hundred grand account. It's, 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 it's something that's fascinated me as well. I've never really, have you ever tried it? I've never, I've never done it. I've not done FTMO before. Yeah. I've got some private capital before that. Right. I might do it in the future though, because I'm interested in it. Like, like you said, I also teach people how to get funded, how to, how to pass the challenges. Yeah, you so do, don't you? I might get it as a just to kind of show them it's possible. Yeah, so, so you've had yeah. some, some success with that. You've helped a lot of people. Yeah, students are able to pass it really well once they apply, like what we teach them, like the risk management part of it. Right. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. It's, it's a whole new area now, isn't it? Well, it's not that new anymore, but yeah. it's for, for people that are coming through, you know, young people especially, they want to trade, they want to get some finance. It's just such a... It's get some everything. more capital. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing yeah. how you can just run one of these challenges and get, have access to so much money. Interesting. So we'll get to talk about like how this works maybe later too, but mm. one of the main comments in the past interview we was done a few months ago in Phuket was the fact that, oh, like, we did a whole, a whole video where you show like how you trade, how you look at the market, you use Fibonacci, a few other tools. And a lot of people were like, oh, well, this guy traded for, for institutions before, he used to work for like big banks, he have done their analysis. How can he use like the RSI or like the Fibonacci to, to do this stuff? Like the thing that people in, in banks or institutions is like a fancy technique, a secret hack to look at the market. Like tell us how it is in banks, institutions, how do people look at the market? How do they trade? Is it based on something that we don't know about or is it based on like these common tools that everyone knows about? I don't think there's any secrets anymore. You know, I can only talk about my experience. When I started trading on the floor in the 90s, of course, we didn't, you know, mobile phones were only just coming out. You know, and when we were pit trading, it was all very um, analog. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't digital. We, we, did, we couldn't have any digital um, gadgets in the pit. Um, we, could, we, we had paper with um, 
with our theoretical prices on. If we, if we wanted to, if the, if the market moved that much, we had to shout at the booth and shout to the clerks in the yellow jackets and say, oi, print me off some new sheets, you know, uh, while I was an options trader then. And we'd tell them that volatility's moved or whatever. You know, I, you know, I still have nightmares or dreams where I'm in the pit and I don't know what my gammas and my deltas, uh, I don't know how many futures I need to hedge because I can't get the sheets printed off. It's crazy. That's great. It's like 30 yeah. years ago. Um, but anyway, sorry, I'm going off, off on a tangent a little bit. So I've, I've never actually traded at a bank. I, I, I was financed by a big American trader who, who came over to London and set up a company and he financed us to trade on the floor. And I was an options trader for him. But when I left the floor and I set up my technical analysis business, um, all my clients were bank clients. So I think that kind of proves to you that what the, the, the technical analysis was taken seriously by the banks. They had their own departments that were, were churning out analysis. Um, so they, they took techni the technicals very seriously. But the reason they wanted my service was because I, I was very short-term focused. So I gave them a perspective over the next 24 to 48 hours, which of course they weren't getting on a daily basis from their analysis departments. Uh, and so that's why they took me on and that's why they paid me. And so the business took off quite quickly. Interesting. So I don't think the banks look only at technical analysis like by itself. They might combine a few factors into it. Do you have an idea of like what else they use to make decisions on, on their trades? Is it based on fundamentals a lot? Is it based on something else? Well, they're lucky because they see a lot of order flow that the retail trader would never see. Of course, you know, they're getting a, a lot of back and forth flow from all their desks. You know, I don't know how much they communicate with other desks, but uh, that's a really luxurious position, isn't it? To be able to see where the real money is moving around the market. Do you think the retail trader has access to that kind of data in some ways? Are they able to look at the charts in some ways to look at that or? Like, nowadays, you know, you, it's quite easy to see the volumes, uh, you know, where the, where the volumes are moving, but you're only seeing that after the, the trade. I think banks are, are getting the orders coming in, so they know where the, where, where the flow is coming uh, before it hits the market sometimes, which it, it's got to help you, isn't it? The reason I think is that like, there's a lot of like, YouTubers online who try to show people how to trade like, the banks. They try to like, look at certain techniques and how to look at like, what orders the banks are placing. Do you think there's any value into it? Do you think there's any way to look at that? I think there's got to be. It's, it's, just, it's important data, isn't it? You know, I, I sit in front of a chart, so I'm trying to judge demand and supply just by looking at what's already happened. And you know, I'm looking at the candle patterns and the candle formations and you know, all the usual stuff, the trend lines and the moving averages, trying to figure out what's the trend, what are most people doing, what are the big boys doing. Uh, but if you're actually sitting in the bank and you're on the phone to a, another big bank who wants to buy a, you know, a big amount of whatever it is, you, that, that order hasn't hit the market, but you know what the clients want to do as, as a broker. It's got, it's got to be helpful. So in terms of your analysis, I know we discussed this in the past interview, which I'll try to link here in the corner of the video so people can watch it directly. Uh, we go through your whole strategy that you look at, your whole analysis of the market, like you look at the weekly chart, bigger time frame, then you go down lower time frames. What about traders who want to do this by itself? They just want to use analysis or technical analysis by itself to place trades. Are they able to do it or do you need something else to make good trading decisions in the market? I, all, my, all my trading is purely done on technical analysis. I mean, obviously, I've been doing this 35 years, so I understand how the economy works and I understand what effect um, you know, macroeconomics can have on the market. But for me, that's, that's a factor that is just in the back of my mind because, okay, we know inflation is through the roof. We know interest rates are going to be going, continue to go up. We don't know quite how far. You know, um, we know all this, but that doesn't help me decide where the stock market might go by, by tonight or by tomorrow. But my, the technicals really help me to identify levels where I can put on low risk trades. And I don't, think, I don't think the macro view or the fundamentals will help me do that this morning. You know, I've, got, I've now got three or four positions on uh, based purely on my technicals. And at the moment I've managed to, well, the last time I looked anyway, I've managed to buy right at the bottom of the, of the, of the move this morning. Hopefully it still is. And that's purely down to the technical analysis. And again, it's just fibs, trend lines, moving averages, where it all converges. And it looks like a low risk support area for me to buy. And I can have a tight stop. And that's all, that's what all we're trying to do, isn't it, as traders? Exactly. One thing I got from a past interview is the fact that you're, like, you're much more willing to take trades based on levels compared to like, I would look at trades you have more, more confidence to be certain of something, to have more certainty into the trade. You'd probably take more trades than me in the market because of that at these levels. Tell us what pushes you to take a trade. Is it based on like a few levels lining up or is it based on something else? Or do you look at like some things that need to be there 
Or is it just like a mix? And then if you have a mix, you can take a trade there. Yeah, I su- it is a lot of experience. You know, I'm, I'm lucky that I've been doing this with the analysis alone for 15 years. Um, so you kind of get a feeling. Uh, but I'll put more emphasis on the longer term charts. So if there's a massive level on the weekly chart or the daily chart, when I say a massive level, it could be a trend line intersecting with a 61.8% fib. So the market's been trending up. It's come down to the trend line and the fib. And that's it. That could be all it is. And I'm looking for a support area because we're in a bull trend. This looks good enough to me. Yeah, I'm prepared to risk 30 pips on that because I think I could make 100. But then even that, the issue I see is like people who go like big time frame, look at like a zone or something, a support, let's say on a bigger time frame, then you drop down to like maybe in a one hour chart. That zone can be like far off. You can be like way too low or way too high from the zone on lower time frames. True. So how do you accept like taking a trade here and wanting price to go di- in your direction? Okay, that so I'll, I'll copy that sort of technique and I will move it down to shorter time frames. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're right. If I was waiting for the big levels on the daily and weekly chart, it could be two weeks before I ever put a trade on. So by the same, I'll break it down onto the four hour chart and onto the one hour chart, but I'll, I'll use exactly the same techniques. I mean, if everything lines up on two or three time uh, zones, you know, then you feel more confident because you're thinking, well, the big guys are looking at it on the daily chart and they're going to be probably getting in here. The little guys are going to be getting in on the four hour and the one hour chart. So there's going to be, you know, traders who are looking at different time frames, all interested in buying at this level. That's, that's the kind of dream trade where you really feel confident. Now, I know for a fact that people who follow your signals, some of them are going to be successful for, for sure. They're going to get some good results because you trade really well, you have the right signals for sure. Other people might not be successful from your signals. Mm. Why do you think that is? Why do you think some people can use the same signal but still fail in trading? Um, it's all down to discipline and uh, trade management and account management. So I do have people who'll say, oh, you know, I really haven't been doing well lately. So, so one, one, one thing they do is they'll cherry pick the trades. Mm. Now, I, I try to tell people not to do that because I've tried to do that. I might have eight trades for the day and I think oh, these three are the ones that are really going to work. But more, you know, so often I'm wrong and, and, and other trades work. So I try to do, it once I've spotted the trade opportunities, I try to trade all of them. And I just put um, the same amount of risk on each trade. And if I'm risking 30 pips to make 90 pips on all of the trades, if 50% of them work and 50% of them don't work, I'm still, I'm gonna have a good day. This is so true. It's funny how you can see a trade like being a really good trade, you think it's gonna one that's gonna work the best. And then it's the other one working in a set. Yeah, you get so, that as well. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Especially when I trade like correlated pairs, like pairs are similar. Mm. I might like see a trade that looks a lot better than the other ones. Right. But then it's the other one that works better. Yeah. Right. For no reason. Okay, great. I'm glad it's not just me. I get that all the time. So, so I, I do the analysis when I've got no positions on, when my mind is, you know, not biased. And I try and, you know, I don't, I don't aim for a certain number of trades, but I just wait and I think, okay, that's a decent trade. That's a decent trade. Put them all on a list and then I enter them all of them into the market. The other thing is, some of them may not get executed, that, you know, the level might not even get hit. So I don't know how many trades I will manage to do that day. The other thing that comes with it is, people might take the trades, but because they follow a single provider or someone who gives them the tips, they feel like they have to get profitable like right away. They have to get good results right away in the market. Right. And when they have a loss, they cannot handle that loss because they expect you to give them the solution to get some profits after. So there's also, I think, a point of like being able to handle drawdowns for any kind of trader, even if they follow signals or like algos, they need to be able to go to drawdowns first. That's absolutely true. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously we all have our losing streaks. Uh, you know, over a 15 year period, I can prove that I've done very well, but, I, you know, I'll have a losing week every now and then, no question. Uh, I'll have five losing trades in a row. So I, I always tell my subscribers, I always aim to risk 1%. In fact, in this FTMO challenge, even though I've got a hundred grand account, I'm risking like half percent on a trade. Yeah, it's better. Um, I just, I, w- I want to feel relaxed. I don't want to get into a situation where I'm sweating. So I know that if I do that in three months time, the, the, you know, the, the money snowballs real quick when you manage your risk. So I advise people risk 1%. Okay, if you want to go mad, risk 2%, but no more. And then if you have five trades in a row that lose, uh, you're going to lose somewhere between five and 10%. You'll still sleep at night. You'll still have plenty of capital and you can make that back quite quickly. But this is the problem, people overtrade. They, they trade too much, they do too many trades, or they risk too much on the trades. They don't take the profit when they should, they, they get greedy. They obviously think, well, you know, Jason's got his stop there, but I'm just gonna give it a bit of extra room. And they run the, 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 the stops too far. It's all gotta be, we've gotta be robotic. Enter, there's my stop, there's my target, bang, walk away. And, and just don't get involved in the emotion after you enter the trade. And don't get greedy. Yeah, for sure, for sure. 
How do you handle the drawdowns? Whenever you have a losing period, do you stop trading? Do you kind of keep doing the same thing you've done before or is it kind of a mix of something else? My drawdowns are really small because, because I stick to 1%. I, I have stressed, I've, I've knocked years off my life from trading too big and running trades too far and doing everything wrong. I mean, for years, you know, I didn't just wake up one day and be, be a good trader. It, it, it was mistake after mistake after mistake, and just persevering and persevering. I, tens of thousands of pounds I've thrown away uh, learning the first time I started trading futures, I'd been a, an options trader for 15 years. The first time I tra started trading futures, I lost 30 grand, like in two months, real quick. So, and that was, I don't know, 20 years ago. So, you know, I'm not one of these guys that is a gifted trader, not at all. So I've just learned, I don't want stress anymore in my life. I want to sleep at night. I don't want to be waking up, looking at my phone, you know, being down more money than I want to be. And so I just keep it small. And I know that if I do that, two, three, four months down the line, I'll look at my account and go, hey, that's not bad. What do you think reduces your drawdown? Is it based on the fact that you take a lot of trades? Is it based on the fact that you kind of try to move your surplus to break even quickly? Or is it based on something else? Because I know a lot of people are gonna take trades and they might have like maybe 10 losses, 12 losses in a row, and that's for them normal. But you say five losses or something, that looks a lot lower than some people. Yeah, I would say I don't tend to have more than five or six losses at a time. I think that uh, I think that's fair to say. I don't I don't have a breakdown of the stats, but off the top of my head, I, I would say that's fair. I can't really think the last time I had ten trades in a row that were losing. So as long as you keep your risk reward, you know, right, you, you, you keep the risk low. You're not risking too much on a trade, and you're not just trading out of boredom. You know, I think the important thing, the thing about trading is, compared to most jobs, if you have your own company or your or whatever, the harder you work, the more successful you'll be. So the more time you spend at work the more successful you'll be, yeah? You'll beat the competition. But it's not like that in trading. The more trades you do doesn't mean you'll be more successful. The more time you sit in front of the screen doesn't mean you'll make more money. Not, not necessarily. It can actually be, as you know, you, you can over trade, you can, you can do too much. So you really have to be disciplined about how much time you actually spend trading, how many trades you put on, how much analysis you do. That's so true. And a lot of people spend time on the wrong things to in trading. When they want to learn trading, they look at like strategies online, they research like on different blogs. Sometimes it can be too much. Sometimes you can look for too many strategies and you get confused and then it's hard to do anything after. Yeah. Analysis paralysis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what would you tell people to focus on if they want to learn trading? Like what should they spend time on? What should they not spend time on? Okay. So if I was going to teach someone how to trade, the first thing I would do is get them to learn how to spot a low risk trade through through technical analysis. You know, some people say, our oh, technical analysis doesn't work. It does work. I've proved it for 15 years, you know. Um, and I've got, you know, a lot of subscribers that are doing extremely well. A guy on Friday sent me a screenshot. He'd done like 10 trades in a row, six, 700 pound winners. You know, he, he made like six, seven grand that week. Once you can, uh, understand, you can identify a low risk trade and you understand how trends work and all the basics of technical analysis, Te technical analysis is not difficult. Um, you don't, don't need to learn tons of indicators. Then, then actually the difficult bit is learning the discipline, the account management, the risk management, the trade management, and, and because that's about controlling yourself, controlling your emotions, as you know. I think that's the hard bit. How do you manage your trades? Is it just based on, because some people are more like on the style of, like you said, then you forget it, you go away, then you don't touch your trades. So people are more like, they want to kind of get the, the right optimum point in the trade, they want to manage it more closely. Where kind of are you in that kind of spectrum? I'm at the stage now where I can even forget I've got trades on. But that's because I'm trading so small that I don't care if I lose. I'm not bothered. So if I have five trades in a row that lose, you know, okay, I don't want to lose the money. Um, but, you know, if I'm down 5%, I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to sleep fine. I'm not going to be stressing. I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to be feel confident enough to put more trades on. That's the, that's the important thing. When you, when you overtrade or, or when you risk too much or when you blow a hole in your account, it's not just the loss of the money, it's the loss of the confidence. It's, it's a big setback you know, emotionally and it's draining physically. You know, your mind's all over the place, you can't think clearly, you're worried about putting on another trade. So it's, 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 the, it's the length of time it takes you to make that back when you've ruined your confidence. It's just not worth it. Keep it small. And, and, and just be there to fight another day. Make sure that tomorrow you wake up, you feel confident in yourself. Yeah, I, I made some losses yesterday, no big deal. I knew I could lose on those trades and that's what happened. I'm now ready for, for the next day where I can probably make it back. 
how do you gain back that confidence once you lose it in the market? Like, it's, most people will start trading with like a really high confidence. Yeah. Then they get a few maybe losses and they get a big drawdown and they lose a bunch of money. Then they lose their confidence. How do you get that back to a good level? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, obviously, like I say, keeping the risks down helps because then you don't get yourself into a blind panic. But yeah, I mean, if you've had 10 losses in a row and even if you've kept it small, you could still be down 10 or 15% and that is going to hurt. So it's a good question. Um, you know, sometimes you do need to just step back and say, whoa, okay, what I'm doing isn't working. And it might not be working because you're a trend trader. You're a guy who likes to buy in to support on a bull trend or you're a guy that likes to sell into resistance on a bear trend. And the market might have just been going sideways and it just might not be the conditions that work for you. So maybe you have to sit back and say, hang on a sec. Yeah, this, this, this isn't my kind of market. And you find another market that is trending the way you like to trade, or you just say, I'm just gonna leave this now, wait for, the, wait for a pattern. Now, sometimes I write in my report, because I have to write a report on certain markets every day, but I can't always have a strong feeling about every, all 21 markets. So sometimes I just have to write to my subscribers, I don't know, I haven't got a clue. I don't know what's gonna to happen today. I can't identify any reliable trading levels. Sorry, I'll try again tomorrow. That's just the reality of trading. And you have to be prepared to say, day off. I think the big mistake people make is they attach their self-worth to their trades or their results. Yes. If they win, they feel good, they're yes. super happy. If they lose, they feel really bad and crappy for Definitely. the next few days. I think we all do that, you know, I'll still do that now, I don't deny it. Yeah. If I have a good run, I'll, you know, I think I'm Superman. You know, have a bad run, I'll be like, God almighty, this is the end of it. You know, I've lost my touch. I think we all, we all suffer that. And that's why we have to keep the risks small so that we don't get emotionally destroyed. We just feel a little bit bruised. Do you feel like writing these reports help you in any way to kind of become a better trader or to kind of focus on or kind of practice your craft of reporting? Or is it something that you think is just something on the side you do? No, definitely it does. And especially when I started, you know, I learned technical analysis for, I don't know, let's say a year, six months, and then I started this service, I kind of fell into it. I didn't expect to be setting up this service. Basically, I worked for a broker and I, I said to the broker, hey, you know, I do some analysis, do you want to try showing it to the clients? And the clients loved it. So then when I left, the clients said, hey, you know, we, we want to continue this service, can you do it? So I was forced every day to get up at five o'clock and, and work till eight o'clock and do three hours of analysis every day. And it was, it was almost, it was more important than trading for myself. Because if you've got Deutsche Bank, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, you know, these guys, and you know, these are big guys, then they're not gonna tell you off if you get it wrong because they know you can't get it right every day. But if you're no good, they'll give you, they, you know, they're gonna cut you. And, and there was, it was a lot of money coming in. So I didn't wanna get it wrong. I didn't wanna let them down and I wanted the money. So that forced me to do the 10,000 hours or whatever it is they say that takes to become an expert. So, um, yeah, you've got to have a passion for technical analysis. If, you, if you're doing it just to make money, I don't, I don't think it's going to work. What do you think is the difference between good analysis and bad analysis and trading? Because like you could look at like the same chart and place your stuff, your lines differently, your zone differently, and then one will be profitable, one would not be profitable. Mm. One would be just like a rhythm analysis. What's it's the difference a, it's there? It's a good question. I mean, yeah, you could put five analysts on this bench, show them a chart, and you could get five different opinions. You know, I've, I've even done it myself. I've looked at a chart in the morning and thought, yeah, that's a good level. And then I go back to it two or three hours later and I think, uh, I don't know if I would trade that now. So, you know, you even do it to yourself and I, I don't really have an answer for you. I don't know. Tough question yeah. for sure. Yeah. And how can people practice if they want to become better at analyzing the market? This is, can you just like back this or is there something you recommend them to do to practice kind of spotting the right levels? Back testing, I'm sure is a good thing. I've never done it. But that's, you know, I guess because I started a long time ago and I've built, built myself up that way. But backtesting surely must be a, a good thing to do. And it really is, you know, I, I said that uh, more hours in front of the screen physically trading isn't necessarily a good thing, but more hours in front of the screen looking at charts. I mean, there's a million different markets that you can look at. And it doesn't really matter whether it's commodities, Forex, stock markets, stocks, uh, crypto, whatever it is, it's all price charts and they all, fundamentally, you know, moves in similar ways. So just the more time you spend in front of a chart, putting in the lines on, putting, you're seeing how the trend lines work, seeing how the moving averages interact, and seeing what moving averages work better for you in the, in the time frames that you trade, just playing around with it constantly, and, and then, you know, it'll all start to come together, I think. Yeah, I think the more repetition, the more you see a pattern, the more you can visualize it better, the more you can be aware of how it will play out next time. But I think it's tough if you just like be in the market day to day, place trades, it's tough to also remember these things because like you can see it's, it's a thousand times but if you don't notice it really well 
you don't take note of it, it's hard to remember the next time. Yeah, true. I, I kind of use the training, uh, the, the learning, learning to drive analogy. You know, when you learn to drive a car, ooh, it's, it's so difficult. There's so many things: mirrors, indicators, steering wheel, gear stick. Well, if, you, if, if you're not driving a manual, you know, and then it's traffic lights and it's changing direction. There's so much going on when you learn to drive a car, but you do it long enough, uh, it's just automatic. You can you can go from A to B and be on a 30 minute car journey and you'll forget how you even got there because you're just doing it subconsciously because it's automatic and eventually analysis becomes not quite like that but you do subconsciously spot things and you, you know that you've seen maybe seven eight nine ten times before that works and your brain's thinking uh i just feel this is right and it's almost your subconscious because you've just witnessed it so many times it's experience and the same time in trading the thing is like like they usually rated on how good or their trades are, if, if their trades are profitable or not. Well, it could be like looking at the charts, having like a really good analysis, but then your trades are going to be profitable, and that kind of hurts your credibility out there. Yeah, and that's usually down to, again, trading too much size. Uh, you, you know, if, if you're trading too big, then it could be a case of your, your stocks are just, I, I did this for a long time. I was greedy. I wanted to make a lot of money on every trade. So I knew really that my stop should be here, but I would tighten the stop so that I could have a bigger size. And I, I just kept getting stopped out. And you know, because I was trading too big, each, each stop hurt. And in the end, I was just like, okay, you have got to trade smaller size with wider stops. And you know, you, you'll make less money on each trade, but you'll have more winning trades and you won't be stressing out all the time. How big or how small should a stop be? Is it based on like a level on the chart? Then you kind of add some buffer to it. Or how do you pick your stop in the market? For me, it is based on the level on the chart. But generally, it seems to work that I have around 30 pip stops, and that kind of works because at the moment you can you can have a trade risk 30 pips, and you are seeing 100 pip moves in in uh, forex markets. So that that ratio kind of works quite well. I mean, that's only recently, two you know, two or three years back, maybe before COVID, when things weren't quite so volatile. You'd, you'd be really looking to to risk 20 to try and make 40, 50 if you're lucky. And that's based on the 15 minute chart. It's quite low. Um, I don't go. I don't go shorter term than one hour. Okay, one hour. Yeah, I yeah. know one hour is pretty tight still. Thirty yeah. pips. But yeah, okay, that's good. Yeah. Now, how do you place your targets based on a level in the chart again, again? Levels, yeah. Okay. It really is just levels. Now that's a tough thing too, because some people could be greedy on like trying to get the best possible like exit in the trade and placing yourself like really close to the zone. How much kind of buffer do you give yourself to kind of exit before the next zone? I'll give myself ten or twenty pips. Again, you know, I, I, again, I had I had the problem with greed when I actually did get into a winning trade. You know, then I, I held it on, held on for it way too long. So often, boom, see it go up. You're thinking, yeah, it's going to go more. I'm up a fortune, and the next thing it turns around, it's back to where you got in. You know, I've, we've, I've done it all. So you really have to. That's why you have to set your target before you get in the trade, and just wait for the target to get hit, and don't and don't take the target out hoping to get more. So you prefer to keep your targets fixed compared to trying to kind of trail your stop loss to getting a better exit? Yeah, I do. I'm not very good at trailing stops. I seem to get, I seem to trail it and get stopped out before it then goes and hits my target. That's all about like knowing yourself, knowing what you're best at and kind of doing what works with you. So that's, that's yeah. a good example. I know a lot of traders preach like having a stop loss to trail, to get more out of the trade, yeah. like catch bigger moves. But yeah. if it doesn't work for you, then there's, there's no point doing that. Yeah, some people are good at it. I, some, for some reason, I seem to be terrible at it. I just seem to trail the stop too, too much or anyway. What would be your advice for people who want to actually get funded by a prof firm? They want to get to the point where they have enough consistency to get funded by a prof firm. They want to pass a challenge. What do you tell them to kind of focus on? Focus, just focus on their discipline. I mean, the good thing about the, the, these funded trader accounts is they demand discipline. Their rules are so strict. You break the rules, you're out. Yeah. So you, you might make money, but if you don't stick to their rules, you're out. And, and I think that's terrific. It really enforces the discipline. Uh, for example, the one I'm on at the moment, I have to make 10 grand um, within, I think, 30 days, and I have to trade for at least 10 days. If I lose five grand, 5%, I'm out. I, if I lose more than two and a half grand in a day, I'm out. So I really have to be careful. It's not about how much money you can make and how quickly, it's about how consistent you can be and how you can manage the losses, which of course is the most important thing in trading. So if, this is why I think these funded trader accounts are really good, because you've got no option but to be disciplined. Well, like in 30 days, but the, the thing about FTMOs is tough because they have like a lot of rules that 
might not be in the best interest of the trader necessarily because of the, the time frame, the 30 days yeah. can be very, very, hard, very hard to achieve. Yeah. Now, I believe there are some other platforms that are better in terms of these kind of rules. Right. But we'll talk in 30 days how you do with the challenge. Yeah, it'd be interesting to, uh, have you looked into different, the different accounts? Yeah, yeah, of course. So I, I kind of know a bit about the different platforms and stuff. Okay. I know there are platforms that are more generous with the time frame. Right. They give you more time to complete the challenge, which I think is, is the best interest of the trader. Because right. like in reality, there's no point in making like 10% in 30 days. Yeah. If it wants, but then when you get funded, there's no way you can do this again later. Like right. you're not going to replicate that all the time because that's too risky. Uh, so I think I think there's different platforms, different things for different people for sure. Yeah, so but if yeah, if, yeah. if it works for you, then that that's totally fine. Yeah, I'd like to give a few a, a few of them a go actually. So discipline for sure is a big aspect. Mm. Now, some traders are going to be fo are going to try to think about like, oh, which style should you focus on? Which style is best for you? Do you think like, for most people, taking analysis is the best thing to do, the best thing to use, or can they use like, something else that's different? Oh, I spoke to a guy um, on Friday who's scalping, 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 and he's, I think he's like something like nine, nine out of trades are winners. But he, he's in it for just small turns, small turns, small turns. Whatever system he's got is working. And he said he wants to trade, teach me the system. I don't think I really want to trade like that myself personally. But yeah, there's a million different ways to trade. So I think each person has to find what works for them. Like some people will be doing this and they might have a full-time job. So they can't sit there and scalp, scalp, scalp. Or, you know, they might have a business to run where they can have a meeting and then they can go and trade for an hour and then they can go, they go off and have another meeting or something. Everyone's got different lifestyles. You know, you might have kids, you might have whatever. So you've got to figure out a trading style that works for you for the way your brain works and for the amount of time that you've got. I know a lot of people want to keep trading hands off. They don't want to be in the market all the time. They have, like you said, a job, they have a business, they have something else to do, they, or just they have other priorities than being on a chart all day or something. How do you keep your trading hands off? Is it based on like looking at the market every day, at least once in the morning, doing your trades, then you're done for the day, or how do you kind of keep that hands off mostly? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, because of the service that I run for my subscribers, I'm up and I have to do two or three hours of analysis and choose all the trades for the day anyway. And because I'm looking at it over a 24 hour period, my levels don't really change uh, during the day unless there's been a real violent move. So, um, so that's quite simple actually. Once I've done that, I don't really have to look too much. I will look probably every two hours, maybe every hour. It depends what I'm doing. I, like, I don't like to sit in front of my screen all day. I wanna go out, I wanna go to the gym, I wanna, I don't know. I like to have a, a bit of a life that's not just trading. You know, I'm an old man. I don't want to, I've done this for 35 years. I don't want to do this for another 35 years just sitting in front of a screen. But even then, like you said, if there's no point of being there to put more hours where you short yeah. take trades and there's no point being there anyway. Yeah, exactly. And I don't, exactly. I don't think I could do any better. I mean, I, I could, what, what the market has done with me, and it's probably done it with you too, it draws you in. You know, you can get sucked in and you're just looking, you know, instead of looking at the daily and the four hour, you're looking at the one hour and then you're looking at the 30 minutes and then the 15 and then the 10. Before you know what, you're looking at the five minute chart, you know, and there's hundreds of trades an hour that you could do. I, and okay, if that's what you want to do, great, but it's just not where I want to be. So all your trades are going to be placed in the morning, all your orders will be placed in the morning, yeah. or do you place them throughout the day? No, pretty much do the analysis, get my list of trades. On average, there's probably a dozen trade opportunities a day. I chuck them all in the order book. I know that many of them won't get executed, not today, but they might get executed by Wednesday. But each, each morning I'll revise the levels or see if there are some new trade ideas. So, so the, the work really for me is done in the morning uh, before the market opens. You know, what's, what's the saying? Um, plan your trade, trade your plan. So that's what I try to stick to. And these trades will be valid for the whole week or when you cancel them if they're not triggered? For the day, okay. at least. But some of them will, you know, the market may not move enough and, and, and they may still be relevant two or three days later. But obviously I, I, I do the analysis every morning for two or three hours and I check everything and put new levels in. And, and then I call it, I, I call my service set and forget because so many people are not full-time traders. So they have the opportunity to look at what I'm suggesting, put their orders in when they're eating the cornflakes, go off around their day, they can check their phone, you know, and, um, and see how, yeah, that one's executed, that one's working, that one's not working, and just crack on. It's tough, because for me, placing a trade without having like, the, the right like, candlestick in place before the trade will be right. tough. I want to have the right like, candlestick forming, then I want to take a trade. Sure. So you doing it the way where you place your orders in the morning is of course good, because they don't have to be there in the day to look at the charts, but then at the same time, you kind of have to you were flexible with how you enter the market. Yeah, now that's a really good point. And I get asked this question by my subscribers as well. You know, should I wait for confirmation? And actually I'm building a bot. Well, I'm not building a bot. Um, I've, I've got a business partner and he likes my signals, but he wants to perfect it so that 
um, we only enter when we get a bullish signal at the level. Now for me, that's too, too much like fiddling around. But I said to him, hey, you crack on. And he has managed to refine it so that the success, the hit rate is so much higher and the risk reward is so much higher. So I'm really impressed with what he's doing. To be honest, I couldn't be bothered. Um, but so, and I'm quite excited because we're hopefully gonna roll out this bot in about a month. We, 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 he's, done, he's done the manual testing and he's figured out the criteria. Now we've got someone to program it over the next two weeks. So then we're gonna test it at the end of September and I'm hoping in October we can roll it out and, and the bot will do the trade execution. I'll still do the levels manually, but the bot will do the trade um, execution and it will be more based on, as you say, mm. uh, shorter term, shorter time frames, checking to see if there's a, a candle confirmation. And, and that's what you prefer to do, is it? Exactly, and, and the other way I found to be able to automate that, not being in the chart all the time during the day and not like seeing the chart every few hours is to, be ha to, to have an algo doing it, mm. like a bot, like you said. Mm. Uh, so that, that helps. Mm. But otherwise, because otherwise, you have to be there to look at the chart like every four hours, every hour, if you want to take the trades, if you don't want to miss amazing. it. You can use alerts, but even that is not like not fully there. So, but uh, an algo, I think it's definitely worth it. So let me ask you something then. The reason I don't do, uh, don't wait for the confirmation, because of course, okay, you're coming down to a support level. You want to see a bullish candle on a short-term chart, whatever that short-term chart is. And then you see the big green candle, you think, right, I'm going to get in. But the problem is, if that was my level, you, you might be getting in here. Now, if my stop's here, you're now, my stop's now perhaps gonna be almost double what it, well, or put it this way, the stop's gonna be bigger than it would have otherwise been if I'd have got in at the level. So the reason why I entered the, why I went for a candlestick to enter the market is because I have a place not to put my stop loss below okay. the candlestick. Okay. Otherwise it's really hard to put a stop, in my opinion, if you don't have a place to put your stop. All right, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. So that's why the way you say like, where you put your stop is like below the zone, but to me that would be maybe too large and too okay. far. Okay. And I don't really want to risk it because then it's on a clear level. Right. If you have a low of the candlestick, you have a week, then it makes sense to put a stop below the week. Okay, so you're putting in that extra work to make sure that your risk is actually smaller and yeah. you've, got a, you've got a confirmation that the trade is, is, is more likely to work. Yeah. So, that, so therefore you cut out a lot of losing trades and you're actually um, minimizing your risk even more. Yeah, I would think okay. so. Yeah. So that makes a lot more sense, yeah. but it's, it's more work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it depends on like what you prefer and stuff. But you've got a bot now. Is that the way your yeah? Bot so works? I have an algo that that does that too. So yeah. I still trade manually sometimes when I find a pair or a trade that doesn't is, is not triggered by my algo. Right. And then yeah, I go takes the most of the trade anyway on a okay. daily basis. Okay. Yeah. And that's going well. Yeah, quite well. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Now, I know we discussed a lot here. I know we have uh, a lot of good advice for people here. Yeah. Uh, what can they find you then connect with you or reach out after this interview? Oh yeah, thanks. So, little plug, uh, daytradeideas.co.uk is the website. Um, my Twitter is daytradesignals, and also I'm on YouTube, daytradeideas. And um, yeah, and, and listen, thanks for that interview because so it. many people contacted me. I mean, you've got a huge fan base. So many people uh, contacted me saying, oh, I saw you on Etienne's thing, he's great, he's always got good guys on. Uh, and so, um, so that, that really helped That's me. That's awesome. Thank that you. last interview we did pop up really fast. It was insane. So we had a lot of views on that one. I really appreciate that. Jason's definitely a good guy who's legit, who's doing the work, who's in the market for also helping people really well. So that's good. So definitely check out his stuff. We'll put the links below the uh, description of the video so if you want to check it out. And Jason will catch you back in Phuket or Bangkok at some point. Yeah, well, I'm in Bangkok now for the whole of September. So if anyone's in Bangkok wants to meet up, have a chat about some trading, then, then please get in touch. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jason, and we'll catch you pretty soon. Always good to talk to you, mate.